you were yeah. offering it before. Well, that's because he sounded like the colon was about to fall. All right. Weinberg, can you move your computer back a smidge? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's good there. All right. Shit. Now get those Ozark things out of there. All right. <laughs> Damn Arkansas water. That's Texas water. Are those Ozarks? Look at the pack. Ozarka the pack is from Texas. Ozarka. Yeah. Sorry, we won't anyway, debate this. Drew's You're you have the floor. Sorry, we've gotten a little punch drunk here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I am um, going to present on my honors thesis, which is analysis of the factors that influence ethnic violence and minority violence in the Western Balkans. So I was talking um, with Dr. McBride and Dr. Gibson before you guys came in. I became interested in the subject when I did an internship at the United Macedonian Diaspora in Washington, D.C., where I dealt with a lot of um, factors that influence minority violence. We wrote a lot of different reports, but I felt like there was a hole in the literature. I felt like there was never um, an analysis of this region in particular where you could tell a correlation between an international actor influencing and increasing the ethnic violence in this region. So my first question was, what factor contributed most to the increase of minority violence and ethnic conflict in the Yugoslav Wars? I picked that timeline specifically because it's about 10 to 11 years, and so um, it wasn't too vast and too much to get into, but it was enough that I could really uh, do a lot of comparative analysis of the different uh, states in that region and how they were influenced by the ethnic violence. While there were a lot I looked at, I picked uh, NATO involvement specifically as the factor that I delved into into my project, and I tried to answer how that NATO involvement has caused a rise in the civil unrest and ethnic conflict. So my argument is that NATO indeed has caused ethnic violence through its selective and strategic militarist interventions in the U.S. Gulf Wars in the 1990s. Furthermore, I want to add that I believe, and especially in this case, that NATO's success and failure, failure should be judged by how the NATO's actual meeting those objectives that they set for their missions affects and influences and impacts the ethnic and minority populations. Whereas a lot of scholarship decides that NATO's success should be looked at by making factors and completing those, those missions, I think that it's more important to look at the human rights abuses and the actual impact on that population. I do want to add, and I'll talk about this more later, while NATO has caused ethnic violence in this region, I don't think necessarily that it is a failed organization necessarily, but I do think that changes need to be made and steps have to be taken in order to save the transatlantic alliance for NATO in this region. So as far as my literature, I looked at three specific um, fields that I think are important. I looked a lot about identity and self-determination. It's very important to notice the difference between a political identity and a socio-cultural identity, especially for these ethnic populations that don't agree with um, the majority-run government. Conflict regulation, in fact, where how some governments will deal with different populations differently. They may treat the minority populations worse than the majority. And territorial autonomy, as it coincides with the Kosovo region in Serbia, with regional autonomy and the differences between federal and state autonomy. So, while I could talk probably for a really long time about ancient Balkan history, I think the most important thing to know is that they have a long history of ethnic tensions. This is not something that started in 1989 and blew up in 1990. Since ancient times, this region has been so culturally diverse that these groups of people have always been in conflict with one another. The four major conflicts I used for my study were the Slovenian, Croatian, Bosnian, and Kosovo wars and independences. But I would like to note that there still are much and many more conflicts and important um, events that happen, and not to belittle those events, it's just NATO involvement in these were the most important. So a quick timeline just to show you how complicated this is. Uh, Slovenia and Croatia declared independence in 1991. Um, the Cro Croatian war lasted for five years. 
And then during that time, the Bos Bosnia and Herzegovina declared independence and then were. 1995, the Bosnian War ends with NATO's bombing campaign. 1996 is when we really start to see the uh, complete dissolution of Serbia and the Kosovo crisis, eventually beginning the Kosovo War. And 1999, that is when officially NATO declares that the war is over between uh, Kosovo and the ethnic, um, excuse me, and the Serbians. So, NATO involvement in the first two conflicts is very indirect. And if not looked at very closely, you could say that they didn't have any influence at all in these wars. In 1991, the 10-day war, or the Slovenian uh, independence war, began when uh, Serbs in that population refused to acknowledge the independence that Slovenia had just declared. And that began a war between their government and that Serb population with the help of Serbia and the Yugoslav People's Army. This only lasted 10 days, but was still a pretty horrible conflict for only being 10 days. The next, which lasted much longer, which was Croatia's War and Independence. And that also began when the Serb population in Croatia completely um, would not acknowledge Croatia's independence. And the president of Serbia was actually more worried about getting Croatia because there were so many more Serbs in this country. While NATO primarily remained neutral, they did, um, in 1995, start Operation Shark Guard, which was a joint arms embargo and naval blockade of the Adriatic Sea and former Yugoslav countries. And this actually caused um, successful trading of weapons and other things between Serbia and the Serbs in Croatia, because they were so entrenched and embedded in that society, it was easy for them in that re region to move weapons over. And the Croatian government wasn't able to buy these weapons and to get the help they need because of this. Um, because of this. And because of this, over one-third of Croatia was in Serbian control by the first year, by the end of the first year of the war. NATO in the Bosnian War, to me, is one, probably the most important um, evidence in this thesis because when it began in 1992, most of us, I wasn't even born then, most of us really didn't know what was going on. If you ask Americans today, they still don't really know the specifics of this war. And at the time, it actually resulted in the most life loss since World War II. Over um, 100,000 died, 2.2 million displaced, and over 50,000 women were actually subjected to a form of genetic cleansing through uh, systematic rape by the Serbs and Serbian nationalists in this country. So it was a pretty horrible conflict. Unfortunately, NATO and other world actors didn't really do much to help. And I have three instances in particular that um, you can really tell how NATO failed in this case. One in, uh, the first one is the UN safe ship zone of Srebrenica. This is very important because, like the rest of the country, almost more than one half of the population is Muslim. And the president of Serbia was very Islamophobic. So one of the main purposes of this war was to wipe out as many um, Muslims as he possibly could. This region was a village with over 200,000 Muslim men, women, and children. Um, when the UN state peacekeepers that were stationed around the zone and NATO officials realized that Serbian forces were coming to uh, come in contact with this village, there was no consensus and they actually pulled completely out. And in the 10 days that the Serbians were there, over 80,000 Muslim men, women, children were killed just within 10 days. And now it's called the West's greatest shame. So to <laughs> combat this, they started Operation Deliberate Force, which is their first ever bombing campaign. Unfortunately, it resulted in large civilian casualties and one of the largest refugee crises that that region has known. And then to end everything, NATO and other international actors created the Dayton Accord, which officially ended the war, but the faulty framework didn't set up Bosnia for a successful future. They actually ended up segregating the different cultural regions, and as we know, segregation only leads to more hate and more tension, not the dissolution of it. Finally, NATO in the Kosovo War. While this had been 
Um, well, the conflict between the Kosovo Liberation Army, which is the ethnic Albanians in the southern part of Serbia in Kosovo, and the Serbians of Serbia were fighting. It didn't really come to a full-scale war until 1998, um, when the KLA started attacking these police stations and really started to make an impact on the Ser Serbian government. In 1998, NATO's response was to do something called the Balkan Air Show, which was the idea of flowing, flying warplanes over Albania and Macedonia to show support and cooperation between these two, um, between us and this region. Unfortunately, Serbia took it as a direct um, threat and from the United States and NATO, leading to the largest summer offensive by Serbian forces, which um, included over 1,500 ethnic Albanians, over 300,000 displaced. So I think it's easy to see, especially in this instance, where NATO's involvement continually hurt more than they help. Finally, in 1999, NATO uh, did a second bombing campaign in Kosovo, and even worse in Bosnia with the civilian casualties of the refugee crisis. It was so bad that neighboring countries in Macedonia actually started fighting um, in relation to this. So, what are the implications and the Balkan question? Why does this matter to us? I think it's easy to see that NATO actions directly cause this ethnic violence and minority violence. And the region is still unstable. Even in 2015, years after these conflicts, the region isn't doing any better, arguably still doing, <laughs> doing even worse. So what can we do about it? I think that NATO needs to rethink their strategy for this region, and I think enlargement could possibly be the answer. Because as someone who's worked with, with uh, a company from this area, they view NATO as a beacon of cooperation and peace. So I think it's important to realize that if we want a strong presence in this region, we really need to make efforts. So if I want to leave, <laughs> if I want to leave something with you today, just the fact that it's easy as political scientists, and especially those who are interested in international relations, to only look at the big picture of things. But I would urge all of you, and hopefully especially organi organizations like this, that it's the people that matter, and sometimes the costs of all these missions are just not worth it. I love that you finished with that. I didn't know that you were going to say that. Um, my Question is a big picture question. Yeah, yes, please, please sir. Okay. Please um, So big picture, mm -hmm. uh, because apparently that's what we political science are interested mm -hmm. in. What we're to do. Um, Bob is interested in all pictures. Uh, yeah, well, to some extent. So here, I want you to think about it is us. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about the theories of comparative politics and international relations that we've talked about over the years. Class, class, my class. Um, this you've done a lot of research on what happened. So, com associate it with some theories of what is this an example? What do we know, what have you learned about how the world works, whether you agree with it or not, that we could point at this and say, see, this is an example of what so-and-so said about this. You don't have to give a person's name. But yeah. like, what, what, yes, the small picture, but put it back into the big picture okay. and show me where it goes. Well, how I think it is and how I think it should be are different. So, how I think what this is an example of is a more realist, perspe realist perspective, like states are only worried about their security, their power, and their own individual interests. But I think we need to take, and I'm pretty sure it's called neoliberalism, which is the idea that we do want this collective security and we are willing to give up some autonomy to be in these organizations like NATO and international institutions, but we also need to work with these small non-governmental organizations. Like I think this, a lot of this could have been avoided if they would have asked the human rights organizations and other interest groups in these countries. I realize that sometimes can't be practical, but if, if that makes sense for yeah. the theory. Is, is NATO 